Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Emmy Hermini Horses, and I am the program manager of special initiatives at First Peoples Fund. Today is the first vir virtual workshop in a series of four that highlights the work of, for, at First Peoples Fund. We the peoples of We the Peoples Before Education Fellows. We the Peoples Before is a celebration of the First Peoples Fund 25th anniversary and the Native Sovereignty and Cultural Expression. This event will be held on July 1st through the 2nd at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC. We invite you to join us for this event in person and online. To learn more, please visit wethepeoplesbefore.org and the link will also be available in the chat. Um, to receive monthly updates on the event and on our organization, we ask that you subscribe to our newsletter at bit.ly slash subscribe underscore eSpirit, or click on the link that will also be provided in the chat. Um, indigenous peoples across the United States are largely invisible within the American educational system. In the classrooms where indigenous history is taught, state standards that address indigenous histories often do not extend beyond the 1800s. And these standards are often not required content in classrooms. Misinformation also provides to be significant and serves as a multi-generational multi issue that affects not only learners in classrooms, but the educators themselves. With many teachers having been provided with incorrect representations of indigenous histories and cultures, uh, the We the Peoples Before Educational Initiative seeks to change this by creating multimedia digital educational resources that are being developed by an, an indigenous team of educators and can be used across multiple subject areas. As part of a growing digital library, the initial round of the We the Peoples Before curriculum is being developed in partnership with the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts to be released in the fall of 2022. The curriculum challenges educators to approach learning about indigenous nations and communities in the context of federal and state policies, which have dispossessed us of our lands, stories, languages, artistic practices, and ways of knowing. The work of the artists and culture bearers in First Peoples Fund's family centers this work on how culture bearers and artists across our nations carry on adapting and reclaiming ancestral practices to create resilient communities. Today, you will hear from the, our five of the six Indigenous educators who are leading this effort as the inaugural education fellows. You will have a chance to hear from their experience as students and educators, what is needed in today's classrooms, and what you can do to help. Uh, please join me in welcoming the education fellows, Leona Antoine, Nicole Butler-Hooten, Sandy Paco, Ululani Russo, Watnawe Grignon and uh, Lynette Stant, who couldn't join us here today uh, because of responsibilities in her own school district and training educators that she works with every day. Um, so now I'd like to give each of the fellows a moment to introduce themselves. Um, and I'm going to start with Leona Antoine. Lakota Iapi, Ki Uspe Michichie, Na Tokahea. Lakota Wawa Glakekte, Dayan Wachianke, Iuha Chante Vashtia na Bechi Uzapi, Malakota Wia na Sichangu Lakota Oyate, Ashke Guipi, Tioshbae He Matahan, American Indian College Fund Al Ktawani, Education Specialist He Macha, Ampowi Chakvi, Lemie, Na Leona Antwine He Machiapi. Hi, my relatives, it's good to see all of you. I'm learning Lakota. I wanted to start speaking Lakota language first. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, I welcome you with a good heart and a warm handshake. My name is Leona Antwine. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a member of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe, and I come from the Ashgay Guwipi Tioshbae. Um, our Tioshbae name translates into um, they wrap their hair in defiance, and um, we're known for sticking up for um, people uh, for standing up for what we believe in. And I see that as having um, promoting advocacy for students and for um, Indian people, indigenous people. And this has led me to the path of um, teaching and 
staying in the education field through the American Indian College Fund as the education specialist. Um, thank you for listening and for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, Leona. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Nicole to introduce herself. Kayla Shaushi, Nicole Butler Hooten. I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz of Oregon, the Chetco Band, and the San Carlos Apache Tribe of Arizona. I go by she, her, hers. I was a second grade and fourth grade teacher for about 15 years. And um, this year I've stepped out of that role and I'm now an instructional coach. And I'm also in a um, doctorate program through Walden University. I love teaching, I love supporting teachers, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you, Nicole. Um, Sandy, would you mind introducing yourself? Kanukitbin, um, Uvanga Sandy Paco. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, my name is Sandy Paco. I am uh, Inupiaq on uh, my mother's side from the Shaktulik, Alaska uh, region. Um, I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. I am now living in um, Oregon. Um, I was a teacher for 10 years. Um, my specialty was K-12 music. Um, I am now working for the American Indian College Fund as the college readiness program administrator. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm just really excited to, um, to be here today and to um, share um, what we've been working on together. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Watnaway? Also, Mauni Weak, Watnaway and Akayan, Ben Greeno and Nuiswan. Kaiis Mamachi Tawak, Nage Pamata Sewak, Mawao Natotam, and Wawan and Wawan and KHP. And I'm really glad to see you all. And my name is Watnaway, which means the lightning flashing off in the distance, Ben Greeno. And um, I come from Wisconsin, Menominee people, Kayashma Machitawak, which means the, uh, the ancient movers, which talks about us moving um, around Wisconsin, Great Lakes area um, as part of our seasonal activities and, and food ways. Um, I've been a, a teacher for many, many years. I teach at the Menominee Indian High School. I am the 2019 Wisconsin High School Teacher of the Year, which was the first time it was awarded to a, an Indigenous person in Wisconsin. And, um, and I currently I've, I've took, taken a sabbatical for this past year to um, help develop the um, Pre-K K Menominee Language Immersion Charter School, uh, which will be starting in the fall. And um, that's been an, an amazing, um, an, an amazing journey. Uh, figuring out how do we incorporate language uh, using um, Montessori methods, and and how do we figure out how our people uh, would teach our own people? Like, how do we learn to become Menominee? And I think that's a a, a journey that we're all on, and. Um, and I think that's going to be really important in thinking towards what we're going to be discussing today. So I went in. Thank you, Watnawe. Um, and then um, Lynette or Ululani, I didn't even introduce, say you, I'm so sorry, I almost moved on. Ululani, could you take a moment to introduce yourself, please? Hello, my kako. O Bridge Ululani Kahilio Kalani Russo Koinoam, no Kapahulu Mayao. Um, aloha everybody. I am Bridge Ululani Kahilio Kalani Russo. You can call me Ulu. And I am from Kapahulu, which resides on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. So I am currently an eighth grade science and Hawaiian studies teacher. And I am also a third year PhD student at UH Manoa. And I just want to say mahalo for this opportunity. Aloha. 
Thank you, Ululani, and I apologize for almost moving past you. Um, I also wanted to uh, share about the other fellow that could not be here with us today. Um, Lynette Stant is a third grade teacher um, in the Salt River Indian uh, community in their elementary school. And so she works primarily with um, students from that community and was the 2020 Arizona Teacher of the Year. Um, I think also the first time that that was awarded to a native person in the state of Arizona. Nicole, I don't recall if you shared, but Nicole was also a 2021 teacher of the year in Oregon. Um, so we have just such an amazing group of uh, educators here with us today as the education fellows for We the Peoples Before. Um, so I'm just so excited to share all of their work with all of you that are here today. Um, and really look forward to the, the conversation that we'll be engaging with. Um, for those of you that are attending, you may use the Q&A feature or put questions in the chat. Um, myself and uh, my colleague will also be moderating reviewing those as we go. And when we get towards the end of the discussion um, at one o'clock mountain time, um, which is we come from many different uh, time zones here today. So at the end of this hour, we will be moving into some of those questions that you all have for the fellows or about the We the Peoples Before curriculum, um, the fellowship or the work that they're all engaging with today. Um, so we're, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first question. And I am going to start with Watnawe. Um, what has your experience been with the invisibility of indigenous peoples in schools as a parent um, or a teacher or a student, just any of the experiences that you've had as an indigenous person um, in the field of education? Yeah, I, th I think that um, I, I thought a lot about this question um, since I since I read it for the first time, and um, I was a uh, I went to school at the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, and as an artist in a, in, a, in an indigenous school, um, I had the chance to like really explore um, what art is, what indigenous art is, and um, and and I had these ideas about. Um, do I need to identify myself as an indigenous person making art or can I just be an artist? Can I just be an indigenous artist? Can I just be an indigenous person and be an artist? Um, all these things um, came to the forefront as I was, as I was working through uh, art school and it really didn't have a, um, it didn't really announce itself until I left that school. And I went to a school where I was only one of two indigenous people in an art program. Um, and so I was really faced with uh, my indigeneity, you know, as being um, seen as kitsch, as, you know, you, you are an indigenous artist, so you should be doing things that are leather beads and feathers. And, um, and it's the same thing that, that my father went through at going through art school, um, being asked to be part of uh, in an indigenous art show. And because he was doing more contemporary art, I guess you would say contemporary art, um, he did a lot of wood and metal um, because he didn't have anything that was termed uh, like idealized as being indigenous, they wouldn't allow him to be in the show. Uh, so I guess that 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 invisibility, it's, um, it's a hard thing to overcome. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, even, even talking about it, like, like thinking through all, all these things, you, you come to realizations that, that, oh, that is invisibility, you know, even, even talking about it and, and being a part of it and, and understanding it, it's also a part of invisibility um, because we do have to talk about it, you know? Um, so I'm going to say that much. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. Thank you, Watnawe. Um, I'm going to move, uh, pass it over to Sandy. 
Thank you, Emmy. Um, I can think of examples, uh, both being a student as well as being um, uh, a teacher and um, a native professional. Um, so I'll start with the student experience. Um, growing up, I felt like I was not always um, seen or recognized for the work that I was um, doing. Um, I think a lot of native styles of communication um, are sometimes taken as um, timid or shy um, or were not necessarily considered leadership material. And I think um, the result of that was that I felt often underestimated um, as a student in um, the K-12 system and it actually continued on into um, college um, where I had a, a specific chosen profession that I um, wanted to go into and I was discouraged because I didn't have the right personality type. Um, and this was an area that we need more indigenous um, uh, teachers and we need more teachers of color. Um, and so I decided to push past um, those um, valuations of or those devaluations of my my uh, cultural uh, communication styles and um, go into the career I wanted anyway. And they have never been an issue since. I actually wrote um, about this experience in um, the American Indian College Fund uh, blog. So if you go to their website, um, you'll see it. It's called um, The Stories We Tell. Um, and it just kind of details um, that experience as a student. And I'm feeling like I had to work extra hard to get, um, get through the careers that I wanted and to um, get the recognition um, that I wanted um, to to be able to access um, a job that I chose for myself. And as a teacher and as, and as a um, working professional, um, I've also had, I think, the added experience of speaking up about what those experiences have been for me, for my students. Um, sometimes I'm listened to, at other times um, I, felt, I felt like um, the only voice in the room, especially um, when there's not very much Native representation in the school um, system um, already. Um, and I've also felt like there have been a lot of misunderstandings about um, the Native communities. And um, I've encountered a lot of um, misunderstandings that I just feel like um, people people have been comfortable to voice to me um, that the Native students and the Native families are not interested in education um, and that they um, they are just they're 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 mostly um, centered on kind of what's going on in their um, home lives and there's no place for them in academics and I don't believe that is true I think I'm I am the living proof of it and I think all of the um, the other fellowship uh, members here are living proof that um, we have and we want and we need a space um, in education um, and we need to have um, those opportunities um, to um, have our self determination because what we decide to, to, to do for ourselves, we also um, also give back to our community. And if we don't have that self-determination, it actually affects tribal sovereignty. Thank you, Sandy. I the one thing that I think I've I've noticed between what Watanawe and Sandy have shared so far is just that how others perceive us as native people when we go into all of these spaces and how they perceived native students and native families, um, whether that was us as students or the students and families that we work with as educators. And so I think that that's a very um, present experience that in our conversations over the past few months has been and continues to be central in the need for the work that you all are embarking on. Um, so I just wanted to, to provide some of that that I'm hearing here as, as the moderator. Um, now I, I'm gonna pass it to Nicole to see if she has any thoughts on this uh, question. Thank you, Emmy. I don't know how to follow Sandy. That was beautifully said and walked away as well. But um, I think the invisibility is significant as we've all mentioned. I think that it has impacted the way that I operate in very westernized structures in education. I also um, think about the invisibility perpetuating white supremacy and what that feels like as a native woman, as a native educator. Um, I've often had to ask myself as an educator in staff meetings and professional development in different platforms that I go into, um, 
before I had my teacher of the year award, I'll say that things have shifted and that's been interesting, but um, I've had to ask myself, which part of my identities do I bring into this space and how native can I be? And so, and that goes back to when I was five and six and, um, you know, Miss Pepio and Mr. Hathorne's class sitting there and not being accurately reflected um, in the curriculum and so many negative stereotypes that, you know, we could go into. Um, but I think the result is having that culturally responsive teaching. Um, when you feel unseen, that what does that impact feel like? It's that imposter syndrome that we're constantly battling. And so I want to name that because um, I think that can lead to isolation and resistance. I think it leads to code switching with Native people. And so it's important that we talk about the invisibility. Um, I have a six-year-old and a 10-year-old right now that are operating this. And we, um, well, I just a side note, my 10 year old is up or my six year old is upstairs playing Minecraft with our tribe. And so there's all these tribal supports that are um, being offered now that I am so grateful for, you know, that um, we can tell his friends at basketball, hey, I'm going home to play Minecraft with my tribal cousins. And um, so, so we are strengthening the indigenous presence and um, looking at ways to counter the invisibility. Um, but, but my students, my kids still struggle to be seen. We um, had a big discussion at our school about Native American Heritage Month and, and making sure that we're not teaching from the past because I think that's where educators feel comfortable um, in my district, in my area is teaching from the past. And how do we really bring the power and presence of indigenous people today? What is happening with native issues and um, native people today um, so that we can extend that relationship relationship for our students. Thank you, Nicole. And I think it's important to think about how like the experiences of your children, because that all that looks so different from how we experienced it and the role technology can play in that as well for us to maintain that connection. Um, so I think that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Leona, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you all for sharing and everything you said. I feel, you know, I've experienced and, um, um, you know, thinking about it with this question for me too, and reflecting on it, um, I had to really look back at like how I was raised and what that looked like versus the education that I received in the classroom. And I'm a first generation, um, tribal member who wasn't forced to go to boarding schools you know we talk about it like it was in the past but I'm the first person in my family line you know who didn't have to go so it was very recent and so thinking about like my parents being able to control my education at home because there wasn't fear that I would be taken away um, gave me a really strong identity but also a safe space as a woman or a girl to be able to be heard. Um, and, you know, having that Ashke background too, in our family, they always say like, Ashke women like to talk and we do, but it's because we can, you know, we're able to, and we're heard. And so then going into the education system, even though I grew up on a reservation and went to a reservation school, um, the curriculum didn't reflect anything that I was taught at home. And it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't ever like a natural for me to sit back and say like well this isn't right you know and to question what we were learning and um to not get in trouble because then my family would come in and support me and not everybody has that you know not every student is able to do that and then going in as an educator um on the reservation and having the um autonomy to teach what I wanted to um going into an English classroom um, allowed me to teach Lakota culture and Lakota language because English was a required course, but Lakota culture and Lakota language weren't at our Lakota school, you know, on the reservation. And so um, having to find ways to do that, um, you know, you had to find loopholes and I, I wasn't okay with that. Um, we should be able to have that autonomy to be able to teach, you know, our culture and to be able to instill that identity into our students. And um, as, you know, go going off the reservation too and teaching at off-reservation schools and just finding like complete invisibility was difficult. 
But fortunately, you know, having that background to where I'm able to walk into those spaces and say, um, this is where, you know, this is where we're going wrong here. <laughs> and just, and not feeling like I have to prove it every single time and not making people, not allowing people to make me prove that we are worthy to be in curriculum um, has always had to be, you know, like it's, it's, it's really um, tiring. It's exhausting to be in those spaces, but I'm really seeing like this huge change. And I think it's exciting because we are able to control our children's education. And, um, and so there is going to be better changes coming, you know, it's going to happen. And so it's, it's been up and down for me, you know, as, um, as a student and an educator, but I'm always hopeful. And so it's, it's going to get better. Thank you, Leona. And many of the attendees won't know this, but Leona was a teacher at the high school that I attended while I was there, not my teacher. Um, but it was really, you could see the difference in being able to integrate culture and community into her classroom versus some of the other experiences that people had in our school. And I, I think growing up and then being younger than Leona and then growing up on the res, that there were, there were things that you could see that were changing and ways that um, my classmates that, that were my age, how we experienced some of that slightly different, but then there were still ways that the school was maybe holding on to these other ideas, but seeing more native educators like you all in classrooms and in schools, being able to push back on that. Like it's, it's amazing to see the difference that that makes in classrooms um, and how that growth in, in us recognizing that can change things as well. Um, so thank you, Leona. I, I just felt all of that from, from our school um, and back home. So that was amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Ululani. So go ahead. Hello. Um, yeah, like Leona mentioned, I had to really think back to my education and how I was brought up. Uh, my mom was a Kumu, a teacher at Hala Kumano, which is a public charter school in Hawaii that's really focused on Hawaiian culture. So she got to teach science with Hawaiian culture and I would live vicariously through her. I did not go to that school. I went to a different school and I would always wish that I was in her classroom learning about such things. So I would just oftentimes when we were after school in her classroom or making copies, I would take packets and like try to learn myself and she would teach me. But I was really fortunate to be in, um, to be raised by such a woman who always discussed and uh, showed us how Hawaiians are scientists and things like that. And then being a teacher in the DOE in a public school system, I it's completely different. I mean, Hawaiian culture, uh, practices, things like that are only technically taught with standards in fourth, seventh, and 11th grade. There's a senior year optional class, but a lot of it is focused on pre-contact and the only post-contact um, curriculum really it's in 11th grade and most students don't take that uh, it is a required course but some schools somehow make it so it's not a, re a requirement it's really odd so it just becomes three times in their whole experience as a student in the DOE and it's really a lot of times um, there's been many Hawaiian scholars that have addressed what kind of lesson plans are taught by teachers who necessarily aren't from Hawaii at all, didn't grow up there, not just not native Hawaiian, but aren't even from there. And the uh, misconceptions that are taught, like Julie Kome has a great article about that. But it was just a really conflicting thing growing up in such a positive Hawaiian focused household versus going into this DOE, school and as a teacher I am hardcore putting Hawaiian content within my curriculum and my with the my admin being really supportive letting me do that however it is a constant struggle and I see it I think teacher trainings are something that that like seem to be the hardest part and 
I just really, I really felt a lot of times like we were invisible in the sense of there's this huge movement in Hawaii after the Hawaiian Renaissance in the 70s to create such a larger impact in the public school system to bring Hawaiian culture at the forefront of kids learning. But it seems to be like a nice banner, but when you go into the classrooms, it's a, it's a lot of hard work that doesn't necessarily occur. Um, so there is a push, but there's also a lot of fallout within that. So it's nice to see that it's becoming something that we're focusing on. However, when we, as a teacher, you get to see it from the inside, the, the reality is that it's, we're not there yet. So it, yeah, that's my feedback on that. It's, it's, we're almost there, we're getting there, but oftentimes we feel invisible and the question is always asked as to why focus when, um, yeah, if you're not aware in Hawaii, we're a minority. So Native Hawaiians are a minority there. And a lot of times the question is, what about the non-Native students? So that is a battle that we're constant, constantly fighting. But mahalo for that time. Yeah, thank you, Ululani. Um, that made me think back to what Watnaway had shared at the beginning about as a Native artist, you have to create Native art that looks this specific way. Um, because so often non-Native people think about us as pre-contact or from the 1800s, and that's how they imagine us. I know that all of us as Native people have received comments or questions that seem to be quite ignorant um, in, in my understanding of like how, why do you think that I as a Lakota person still live in a teepee? Like we, we don't, I do not ride a horse to school. Some people do, but that's not my experience. And receiving all of those assumptions as native people um, and how that's perpetuated in classrooms. And that's why people have those misconceptions. Um, and so in my introduction, I talked a little bit about misinformation and how we know that it's not only students, it's not just what the students are learning, but it's what the teachers understand to be true and how they were given incorrect information or a lack of information as educators. And so with that, I wanna move on to the next question because I, th I think that Ululani really kind of tied it up to, to bring us into this next question. Um, but how do you think educators, um, both indigenous and non-indigenous can correct that misinformation in classrooms today? What, what can educators do to make this change? Um, and I am thinking about a conversation that uh, we had had in one of our earlier convenings, just you all, um, I was thinking back to something that Nicole had shared. Um, so I'm gonna ask Nicole to go first. I, I know that you've done some development in this area in Oregon with uh, helping to teach educators and knowing that they need that additional preparation. So how do you think educators can correct this misinformation in classrooms today? Yes, thank you. I'm just plugging in my computer. It says that it's battery small. I think I'm okay. Thank you for that question. Um, I was just trying to frantically write down some notes. So um, I think it's important for just us to recognize that we are gifted um, with the opportunity to do some of our most impactful work when we think about how we can really work to correct the misinformation that we've all just shared is out there that perpetuates white supremacy and native invisibility. So I want us to think about, are you allowing your students as educators to bring in their stories, their traditional stories, their native sto stories, the part of them that makes them who they are? Um, are you considering how to initiate repair and think about education from a humanizing perspective? 
Um, how are you sharing resources within your buildings and within your departments and within your district that are accurate, that are vetted by the tribes? Emmy, you know that in Oregon, we have um, Senate Bill 13, Oregon's Tribal Shared History, that has worked closely with the state level ODE and the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. And so that's a way to strengthen the indigenous presence in today's classroom by having accurate curriculum out there that's about power and presence. And then we're providing professional development for educators. We're giving them resources. We're building that resilience. We're asking them to sit in discomfort as they do this work. Because we know that to do this work well, we have to think about collective healing and what that looks like in our native students. And I think that we can't do that work on our own and we have to recognize our own biases as we're doing that work. So bringing in accurate rest Rest, um, accurate representation is really important because there's so much misinformation. And I see this repeat itself with educators, especially those who have been in the field a while, that um, it's a very colonized mindset. And in order to move forward, we have to ask ourselves, um, what does the equity mean to us? What is this? Why is this important? And how are we incorporating these lessons and these resources to share out? So I get native mentor texts and accurate resources. I reach out to tribal affiliates and, and create responsive um, curriculum to share because harm has been done. And I think it's important that we recognize that, that by, by doing nothing, we're perpetuating the harm. So um, it's when we ask, how do we do this? It's collective because the colonial trauma is there. So ask yourself, what, what does liberation mean to you? What does liberatory design for education mean? And how are you living this intention within your school spaces? I know that was a lot. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Nicole. And yes, I, I think it's a lot, but I think that that's the reality of this work of engaging with educators in order to correct this misinformation is that it's not just providing the, the true information. It's not just giving them accurate tools, but in understanding how to utilize those tools. And so I think that you really talked about ways that you're engaging in that currently in Oregon. And that I know Many of us as educators have done that within our own schools and in our own communities in asking those questions and, and pushing back, but trying to find that balance for us as Native people is how do we um, share this big part of ourselves with our school community? Um, so I think it's, it's big and overwhelming, <laughs> but that it's necessary. Um, and Ululani, I just keep seeing your face perk up. So I'm gonna come over to you because I think you have something to share. Yeah, mahalo. Um, as a department head at my school, I also have written the science curriculum to be culture responsive, specifically in Hawaiian culture and science. And a lot of it entails teacher training. So teaching our new teachers. At my school, we have a high turnover rate and that's the biggest issue for us and a lot of schools that predominantly have Native Hawaiian students. It's a lot high teacher turnover. So when you are training the new teacher, um, maybe one or two years later, it's, an, it's a different teacher. So we really need to focus on creating a space where teachers not only feel valued, but um, specific Native teachers want to teach in our own community for survival. I mean, uh, teachers, we could name a million different obstacles we have, but we're all here for the same reason. We're all here to go ahead and help our Lahui, our nation. And for me, I think opportunities, partnering with different organization, that's been the biggest thing that's helped myself along with my school, um, community members. That is the most important. We have a very large intergenerational trauma system that's going on that we're trying to go ahead and help heal. And that goes with all of our community member, members, making our students believe that staying within our own community is a way to really go ahead and help our Lahui, our nation. However, often our students think that they need to get out of our own community to be successful. They can't be successful in there. They're trapped. A lot of my students often say that. And that's one of my goals by the end of the school year to make sure that they feel like, no, um, there are so many opportunities here and this is how I can be successful. So. 
that is definitely something that um, I'm very passionate about is how to create a space within our education system where our own keiki, our students, our children can feel like they're being represented every day. We're not just saying one grade level, this is the Hawaiian culture, little bubble here, this is what we've done. Every day, every standard, there is something our kupuna, our ancestors have done that has already been done, it just has a different name. And having those connections and creating relevancy within our own students' lives is one of the biggest influence in my life too. I am also a lifelong learner, right? So partnering with University of Hawaii or different like even state agencies like DLNR and things like that, going out into the community, doing work on the aina on the land has been the biggest impact for my students and myself. So when we think about um, how we can correct misinformation, a lot of it is hard work on our part and making sure we know um, what the correct information is from community members, but also it's making sure that we're getting out there. A classroom is not just within four walls, right? It's much larger than that. And as Native people, we absolutely know that. And I think that is the, the one of the most important part is getting the kids out there, getting them to work on the land because reconnection to land um, is one of the most important thing for Native people, especially when we discuss in Hawaii and most of our land has been taken over from military and house developments. And so whatever land we have left to work on, uh, creating those reconnections. And I say reconnection because we have those connections from our ancestors. We just have to learn how to rekindle that and um, create opportunities for our students to see that. Because we know once we come, we go into the adult life, it's a lot harder to have time to reconnect to Aina, to land. So opportunities to do such things um, would be my, my say or what I suggest. And I'm also working on myself to create this misinformation um, to making sure that we're just doing things with our hands, not just our eyes and reading books. Mahalo. Thank you, Ululani. I really loved all of that, I feel that as an indigenous educator and how we can kind of reinvigorate that within our communities, our traditional ways of learning, right? And, and how we taught youth pre-contact or pre-missionary school at least and pre-public school system. Um, how did we engage and learn and, and pass these, this and traditions onto the next generations. And, and that's how we did it was through um, what now we call more like project-based learning or, or different things like that. Um, we're going out on field trips, but that's just how as indigenous people, we have traditionally engaged within our communities. Um, so I really love that. And I love that you're able to do that. Um, at your school and that that's supported. So that's really amazing to hear. Um, and that that supports correcting so much of this misinformation and that at your school, you not only work with native students, but you also work with non-native students. So they're able to have these experiences as well and be able to think about learning and education in a different way that helps people to learn, right? Well, we all learn in different ways. And so it's, it's really amazing that you're able to provide those opportunities for your native and non-native students. So that's really cool. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Leona to see um, how you think that educators can help to correct this misinformation. Sure, thank you to both of you for um, everything that you stated and you shared you know the type of work that you're doing and creating and um uh we have to really look at this allegory of how the united states was created you know and go back to the beginning of really looking at the misinformation starts with that first contact with who came here first and we're still teaching the false information you know it's still in our national curriculum um and it's not okay. It's not okay to lie to children, especially when they can find that information now and they have access to it. Um, and it's not okay to keep creating that 
that story and putting it out there to tribes um, because um, they, you know, we, we still tend to, to, to feel inferior when that happens. And um, we need to, as a nation, really look at it because we're okay with teaching about the Holocaust. And we're okay with putting a Holocaust museum on the National Mall before we have an American Indian, you know, museum there. And so um, going back to, you know, looking at the story of how the United States was created, this is where we need to start. It has to start there because otherwise we're just perpetuating that false, you know, um, creation of freedom. And it's, it's not going to, it's, it's not working. It, it's not working. And, um, and yeah, when students have access to correct information, um, we have to help them uh, look at what they do with that versus um, telling them it's wrong, you know, and having them and making them question themselves. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leona. I, I felt all of that too. Um, I, as an educator, I worked with students who people often felt that they couldn't hear the truth, that it would be too harmful to them. And I think that as teachers, we engage in this when big, scary things happen, right? Where we don't want to talk about things like, um, the war in Ukraine, where people say, well, don't don't talk about it with students because it's it's too much for them. They can't understand it. When we as educators, we know that they can handle the truth and we know that they deserve that truth. And not, not only for the accuracy and how that reflects upon in, in our situation as how it reflects upon us as native people and our communities and people's understanding but that students deserve that truth and they deserve to know the ac the accuracy um and so i i really loved hearing that and i just kept i feel that i feel that and i practice that as an educator with young people and i think that more people need to engage in that and and be ready to question is this true is what we are teaching accurate? And if it's not, what can we do to change that? So thank you, Leona. I just, I'm feeling all of that. Um, I'm gonna pass this over to Sandy because I know in some of our conversations that this is something that we've talked about is, is the inaccuracies and how community knowledge and um, community, um, like fr from native communities, how, how that impacts this as well is this misinformation and how it's pushed out into the world. But what we're doing as educators and engaging in that with other educators and with youth. So Sandy, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you, Emmy. Um, that was kind of a good lead into um, the things that I was reflecting on as I was listening to listening to the other fellows um, speak. Um, I was really um, identifying with um, Ulani what you said about the um, creating um, space um, for um, Native students um, to um, really experience their connection to their land through their um, their education and that place based education being really important. Um, I think my, uh, my, my ideas kind of bridged off of from there to um, including the importance of including space um, for Native ways of um, knowing um, and um, seeing and being, um, especially through storytelling, which is something that we all have in common um, and what that looks like and how, um, how not only um, good for the Native communities um, storytelling it is, but it is for all students, all students can benefit from um, storytelling and what that looks like. Um, and I really believe in the importance of um, creating this uh, space, um, not only for um, teachers, because we know teachers are the kind of the first line, they're the start of this work, 
um, but they really can't be the end of this work. We really um, need all education um, stakeholders to uh, be a part of this work. And that um, includes um, principals, that includes um, instructional mentors who are teaching their staff. That, that, that should be also including um, our superintendents and our school boards. Um, if they um, want to really provide um, equitable education for all, we need all on board, especially um, um, the higher ups because um, this, what we're talking about here is institutional transformation. It's a cultural transformation um, within our schools. And that's a really big thing. Um, so um, for, for all of those stakeholders, I would recommend um, continuing to learn more about the native communities. Uh, there, are, there are resources online. There are um, community, um, uh, there are community organizations um, that you could get in touch with. Um, we're going to be putting out um, information. I highly recommend that. I also would like to put out a plug for the American Indian College Fund. Um, they do a lot of um, staff development um, uh, projects and um, I think events, and then they put out blogs um, that help raise awareness. There are resources out there. Um, and then I would also like to um, challenge educators to um, think about the narratives. We've all been discussing narratives and the perception um, that um, non-natives um, sometimes carry of natives because they don't have all of the information or information is missing. Well, narrative change strategy is, um, is a development by the First Peoples um, Development Institute. And I think in 2018, you can actually Google it and um, they have um, a whole curriculum for um, how, to, how to examine our narratives, examine our bias and um, how to look at um, historically what the narratives have been for um, native uh, peoples and um, how to begin to change um, those things. So I would really recommend that um, along with that, I think DEI, um, for those of the, you that don't, that don't know what DEI is, it's diversity, equity, um, and inclusiveness. I would um, continue to push for, um, for training and um, awareness um, for all stakeholders, not just the teachers um, in that as well. It's been um, one of the, the things that has had the most pr profound impact for me. Um, the more uh, trainings I've gone to, the more um, techniques that I've um, developed to support students, not only um, as a teacher, but now also as a program administrator of a, na a national native-led nonprofit. So it's been super um, important to um, give time and space um, to that. And what it really does is it helps uh, me focus um, the way I think about um, the lived stories that are shared with me and how to elevate those lived stories um, for um, the people who have traditionally not been listened to. And I think that is just such important work. Um, and then I would um, also um, recommend that educators um, move past just teaching about uh, the, the colonial um, era of, of what Native communities have, have uh, dealt with. We have artists, we have um, educators, we have politicians, we have uh, businessmen and businesswomen today um, that are doing amazing things um, that are worth celebrating. And um, those are, those are um, things that we should be um, teaching about in our schools as well today as well. And I think that if we can move in that direction, um, that really empowers our communities um, to feel like they have a place in, uh, in um, academia, um, in our schools. Uh, this curriculum is really about um, moving from um, just focusing on um, dispossession, which is important, um, but also looking at uh, native adaptation, um, reclamation, and resilience. It's kind of the what goes beyond um, those original um, those original federal and state policies and what, where are we today and where can we keep moving towards? If we want to support native um, sovereignty and self-determination, we also have to look at um, what we're doing today. Thank you, Sandy. And Sandy, I'm gonna have you answer the question in the chat because I'm not sure which one it is. Um, but we had been asked who's the group with a process for narrative change, the name of the um, organization that you had spoken about, if you could. Sure, it's Native Change Strategy, um, and it's through the First Peoples Development Institute, and that was in um, 2018. I can put the um, information in the chat here. 
Thank you, Sandy. Um, I think one thing that you said that really resonated with me as a student and as an educator and as someone who has engaged with different types of curriculum in different um, areas of the country is what is thinking beyond colonial, um, that colonial era and experiences with native peoples um, and what's not normally taught. Because something that we've talked about in our conversations has been um, how little we know outside of our region of the country or our own nations and communities, our own states. And I think for me as a human, like I've, I've said this a lot to Sandy and um, Ulalani is that I don't know a lot about Alaska and Hawaii because that's not something that's been included in the curriculum that I'm taught or that I have taught and that I was taught as a student. And that there are so many of those barriers that exist within the curriculum that were provided with by our states. Um, and how much change needs to happen so that we can shift that and we can make that change. Um, which also touches on like the need for that institutional change and that institutional growth so that that's not something we continue to engage with. Sandy, you have your hand up, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just put the link in the chat and I wanted to correct myself. It's the First Nations Development Institute. I wanna make sure I get the, the right name and give credit to where credit is due. Um, and I just wanna um, also thank you for talking about the institutional um, change, Emmy. I think that's where my heart really is right now, especially with my work with American Indian um, College Fund and just really pushing for, um, for all of our stakeholders. Um, especially um, especially the superintendents, the school boards, I think even the unions could really get involved in this work. And I just wanna call out for all of, um, all of those stakeholders to um, take part of this work because that's the, way it, that's the way that change happens. Thank you, Sandy. What no way, I'm gonna pass it off to you. I've really been enjoying listening to you all. Um, I'm getting a lot of ideas on, on what's possible and, and what could be changed. Um, in in my neck of the woods, you know, for, for the longest time, it, in my high school, which is a, a state-run high school, um, with, entirely within uh, the, the border of our reservation. So we've got like 99% native, self-identified native students in there. Um, but like as a as an indigenous educator, it was it was me and the language person, uh, the language teacher in the, in the high school, um, who are indigenous, who are our students had um, the chance to be uh, immersed in in a little bit of what we know, and we don't know at all, of course. Um, but it, it's stressful, right? It, I, I think uh, Leona was talking about that earlier. It's it's not easy because we have to, um, yes, we have to like take care of our curriculum, take care of what we're doing in our classrooms, but then we're asked to go out and, and, and do the prayer to uh, help with uh, the professional development of all of the other teachers, um, which I'm, you know, I, like, I'm glad I'm there. I'm glad I'm able to help. I'm glad I'm able to um, give some ideas. You know, I and, and and I'm glad that that I've been given the 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 freedom to um, to create classes in my school, which I think is something that we need to do as indigenous educators to um, kind of broaden the spectrum of what is being taught in our schools. Um, like Ulani was talking about, you know, getting our kids outside and getting them in the dirt, you know, and, and taking them to our sacred places and telling those stories in the places where they belong, and. Um, so like, like for me, I, I, I developed a class in indigenous representation and film. And so we watch film and we talk about um, how we've been represented, you know, as, as, as indigenous people as a whole. Um, 
those conversations are important. Uh, they bring up a lot of, um, uh, it gives you a, kind of an in-depth view of like how disconnected our, our, our little ones are from, from our cultures and from, from our greater indigenous culture. And, um, you know, it, it's been talked about, you know, like, like this, this generic idea of what an indigenous person is, and then going back and, and getting an idea of, of how they feel about that. Like how, how do you see yourself as an indigenous person living in 2022? Um, so the, the, the opportunity for conversation within the classroom um, to help build self-confidence and resilience in our kids, but give them the tools to, um, to almost like be cultural ambassadors. It's, it's kind of what they have to do. It's our responsibility as indigenous people to, um, to correct the narrative, right? That's what we've been talking about. Um, and so as much as what, you know, we gotta do as much as we can with the time we have with our kids. And, um, and that's what, what I'm hoping to do. That's, that's my goal in, in, as being an educator and, um, and, and helping the, the teachers around me to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge, to talk about the, the mathematics behind our geometric patterns and our beadwork to, you know, all these different things. There's all these different opportunities to bring our culture into the classroom where it doesn't have to, they don't have to have a whole ton of information, but they can then have the opportunity to reach out to our, our knowledge keepers in our community. And, you know, as, as indigenous educators, we are that bridge for them, for, our, for non-indigenous teachers in our, in our schools. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we can't do it all. And we have to rely on our community very heavily um, to be able to do that, to bring those, those elders in, to bring those knowledge keepers in, to bring those language speakers in, um, and then take our kids out and be out in the woods and, and connect with them out there. Um, well, I'm not, not just the woods, right? For Ululani, it might be the ocean or something, you know, but, but for us, it's the woods and the lakes uh, up here in Wisconsin. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you, Wat. No, I, I, I heard something in there that I think resonates with a lot of the conversations we've had before this um, about the responsibility that we hold as educators and the responsibility that we feel to our students, but also to our colleagues, like our responsibility to help them do better for our students to change that narrative and to integrate traditional knowledge into how we experience math, how we experience science. Um, Leon, I know that you had taught a, um, traditional stories um, when you when I was in school. I remember you talking about and teaching traditional stories. Um, maybe it was after I graduated. I can't remember, but I know I know you did stuff like that in in your classroom, and that those are things that I, I know as Native educators that we integrate on our own but in feeling that responsibility to help others to integrate that, I think resonates with so many native educators um, and, and wanting to support other educators in, in doing that, not only for their native students, but to integrate this other way of thinking and experiencing the world for students is just so important. So thank you for that one way. Um, we're gonna move on to um, our last, the last question for, for, for me, for the panelists. Um, so if any of the attendees have questions, please put those into the Q&A box so that we can address those after this final question. And for this final question, um, I'm gonna call on somebody to start it because I know that they have something they wanna say. And then I'm just gonna let you all, um, if you want to add to it, um, answer this, this final question. It's kind of a big one, but it's very broad. Um, so how do we make indigenous communities visible within schools? We know that in some states, 
um, they're required to teach about indigenous communities, but that often other indigenous nations histories from outside of that state or region are omitted. Um, I know I shared on that earlier with my own experience as an educator and as a student. So is it relevant and important for students to learn about other indigenous nations that are not from the states or regions that you teach in? Is there, is there a need for that in schools? Um, what, how do you see that as educators? I'm gonna pass it to Leona because I know you have um, an answer for this question. All right, thank you. Um, it's so important to learn as much as we can about one another and to make connections, you know, to build those connections for students because it'll um, show them that, you know, we, we deserve to be here. We deserve to be um, in curriculum. We deserve to see ourselves and other people like us in curriculum. And, um, and it, it just helps um, strengthen you know, strengthen our nation and um, our, our tribal nations, but, you know, even collectively, like, as a whole country, you know, this is something that um, we really lacks. And even asking students to think about, um, why is it that you don't have an Indigenous neighbor? Why is it that you don't play on sports teams with Indigenous people, you know, and really looking at, like, what happened? Why are they only in certain places? And how do we not repeat this? How do we not continue this, you know? Because it, it's, like I said, it's not working. Um, but approaching it from, you know, an educator standpoint too is really thinking about that idea of like, something's being taken away from us. If we include this narrative, then we have to exclude everything else. That's not true. You know, we're um, in my English language arts classrooms bringing in Lakota culture and other cultures and other stories only enhanced my curriculum. It only enhanced what I was teaching and it, it broadened it, it made it more interesting. <laughs> you know, again, American literature isn't the most exciting thing. So bringing in indigenous stories definitely enhanced it. Um, it also helps students make those connections. Um, you know, it showed them that equality does, it could happen that women do have a voice, women did have a voice. Um, there was gender equity, you know, that um, age discrimination wasn't such a thing, you know? And so we're not taking away anything. All we're doing is we're enhancing, we're making it better. <laughs> and so that's, we have to start with that idea, you know? I mean, that, that's usually the pushback is somebody feels like they have to lose something in order for this to happen. And that's not, that's not what's happening here. That's not, that's not how we're approaching this. Thank you, Leona. Mm -hmm. Trying to see who looks like they have something they want to share. Ulani, go ahead. Yeah, just really quickly. Um, yeah, I think it's super important. Oftentimes as a native person, you feel uh, like your ways of not knowing are just always compared to the Western world. So it's very, it feels very punitive a lot of times, like, oh, that's cute. That's the way that is. Like we do this compared to the Western. But when we compare it to other nations and we compare it to other native people, it feels like a collective powerful moment where you're like, yo, our people are awesome. Like this wasn't just us. Like this is a common thing throughout all these native people. It, it feels like you are a part of this larger community and it, it's empowering, honestly. And I think it's super important. I think oftentimes it seems so daunting as a, uh, as a teacher or whatever is like policymakers and things to try to bring this because we're fighting so hard currently to even get our own people's stories out there in this current system that it's like, oh, more. But like Leona was saying, it's totally beneficial. I often talk about the difference of mo'olelo of stories between different islands in Hawaii and they're different or even Maori and Samoan and they're similar. The names are similar, like Hina and Sina and things like that. And the stories differ, but they're all correct. There's no wrong story. It's all different, but it's all same, same. So I just wanted to say that it feels very empowering oftentimes when we are just compared to just the Western um, societal system and whatever is when we're just feeling like we're alone, but we have this larger community that we have a large amount of similarity. So mahalo. 
Thank you, Ululani. And I think that ties into a lot of the conversations we've had together as educators too. And sometimes it just feels like, oh, you have that? We have that too. And then we just were like, it, it doesn't feel as, I think from, from the ways that I've had people approach me with it is primitive, right? So we all always get described as primitive in textbooks and things. But we know that that's not an accurate description and representation of our communities then or practices that we continue to have today. Um, and so that's just so important to also be able to see those connections and similarities that, that exist amongst our different nations. Nicole, you look like you have something to add here. I'm going to pass it to you. <laughs> I wonder what look I was giving y'all. Um, no, that was beautiful. But I just wanted to add that I was, I'm reading this book by Aaron Jones called Bridges That Heal Us. And it's talking about racial healing and how we, how we heal collectively. And I just want to reiterate what was said, but it discusses this idea of building bridges. And I've said this before, but um, what are we doing to share stories and live in community and bring in those voices of um, what we might say are marginalized populations? Because I think if we ask that, if we center BIPOC student and teacher and educator um, voice, then this work will really come because it's an authentic partnership that we're creating. And that's what we want to be able to do this because I don't even know everything about my own tribal nation and I'm a citizen of two different tribes. So I, I always give educators permission to be co-learners with their students. And so I like this idea of being a co-learner because um, it helps us. And then the idea of building a bridge of racial healing um, because we do wanna be inclusive. We do wanna share stories, but I think educators get stuck. I think policymakers get stuck. I love that Sandy brought in all the voices um, because this is a bigger issue that we're talking about. But um, I think if we're talking about visibility within schools, you know, we are talking about collectivist, human-centered approaches to learning, and we have to center our BIPOC students and voices at the heart of everything we do. And I've said this before, but we also have to rec recognize that some of this work that we're seeing, these westernized perspectives, this primitive idea of, of um, Native communities is a tenet of white supremacy. And so I'm definitely one that has come to be really comfortable with naming that when I see that, and that's taken 40 years, but um, and that's part of my own own healing, but I think we do have to share. And sometimes it looks like radical hospitality when we are sharing in this um, platform and in this way, because um, we have to. Thank you, Nicole. What in a way are Sandy? Do either of you have anything you want to share? Okay, go ahead, Sandy. Sure. Um, wow, I think um, Ululani and uh, Nicole, um, both of what you said just really resonated with me, um, Ululani, um, that piece about, um, um, you know, feeling um, the way that you feel kind of when you're at home versus the way that you feel when you're um, in a school. I think that's a really um, real thing for um, for our uh, Native communities and in our communities of color and um, creating comfort for our students so that they can feel safe in a place um, where they, where they can, if they feel safe, they can actually learn. I think that's um, super important. Um, and then um, Nicole, I think what you said about um, uh, naming um, white supremacy when you see it, I think that kind of goes hand in hand, especially when we talk about um, about how do we make our our um, students feel comfortable? It shouldn't it shouldn't be, um, or how do we make our students feel comfortable? Um, it shouldn't be something um, radical. It shouldn't be radical that our students feel safe in a classroom, that our students feel included in a classroom. And I think um, both of those are are um, some of the first steps that really um, need to happen for our students, um, and that educators really need to advocate for our students. Um, I do believe it is um, so important for these reasons um, that we learn just not just about the uh, Native communities in our regions, um, but um, nationally, when we look at um, federal um, and state policies um, that have been passed and are still kind of, we're still de de um, defining what Native sovereignty looks like um, in a lot of um, uh, different um, policies, um, it's important to know um, the history of that. And it's important to know um, what um, that looks like 
for our um, communities um, past and present. Um, when I was uh, starting to um, really get into the work um, for the fellowship here, um, and I was um, researching Alaska history, one of the things that really um, had a, uh, a really big impact for me as I was researching, um, you know, 250 plus years of, of Alaska history was, oh my goodness, native um, civil rights is directly tied to natural resources and the interest in natural resources um, by, um, by uh, Russia, um, which, um, you know, purchased America, uh, or purchased Alaska first, and then on the United States. And so, and I think this is something that um, we find um, not just in Alaska, but with our communities um, throughout, that often if there's an interest in uh, the land and the natural resources, um, then um, oftentimes um, the policies, um, federal and state um, and regional in that area um, to extract and to use and develop those resources end up getting tied with um, native um, land stewardship and native land rights. And so it really is on all of us to know exactly um, what that history is um, for the native communities um, so that we can continue to think about being inclusive in how um, we um, share the land, how we share the resources, and we do it in a responsible way that is respectful to our communities. I think that, um, we can't really, we can't talk about equity until we really um, talk about um, what, how, what the tie, um, what the tie in and the connection is um, between these for Native communities. And I think um, it's just uh, so important um, for that. Um, in addition to those, those suggestions, I would like to add um, that educators um, continue to reach out to um, your communities. Your students do come from a wide variety of areas. They might not necessarily be from the area that their tribe traditionally um, lived on. So many, um, so many different groups have been displaced. Um, I'm an Alaska native living in Oregon. <laughs> um, so we have students that are, are um, represented for, represented from um, all of the tribes um, across um, across the nation in different communities. Um, it's important to reach out to to our uh, communities and our students and learn what their lived experiences are, learn what their stories are. Um, I think it's also important to um, seek out uh, Native resources. I've already mentioned a couple of them before, uh, the narrative change strategy through the uh, First Nations Development Institute. Um, there are other uh, Native um, Native uh, led organizations and um, nonprofits that I would um, definitely um, recommend that educators reach out to. First Peoples Fund um, does a lot of other um, things for Native youth. Um, the American Indian College Fund, uh, which I work for, um, we do a lot. There are other um, organizations too. So anything you can do to support um, those organizations is gonna go a long way in um, supporting Native communities, especially um, with those with the work that they have been doing already. So we don't have to start like a new work. We, we don't have to in invent a new wheel. We have um, organizations um, and uh, nonprofits and uh, tribal um, groups that are, that are doing this work. And I'm just uh, really grateful to be a proud of um, this one. Um, I think First People's Fund is, is just one of so many and I'm just really grateful for it. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to pass it to, to Watnaway if you have something you want to add. Sure, I'll make it quick. Um, <clears throat> we come from a, a, a people, and I'm talking a greater indigenous people like, like Ululani was talking about, with trade networks that expanded all the way across the United States. Um, in, in my research with, with doing beadwork, I found um, the Great Lakes style bandolier bags, um, portraits of Sitting Bull wearing one, portraits of Chief Joseph wearing one. Um, these things occurred way back when. Um, and I think that, you know, like for, for us, for Menominee, we had a certain protocol of um, how we would do uh, treaty making pre-contact. Um, and, you know, we would get together and we would share the songs, we would share stories, we would share dances. We would share food um, and thinking about like what we're doing now, like the, the adaptation that was mentioned before, like how do we, how do we change the, the narrative? How do we change 
how we do things today. How do we get um, our students to understand that, there, that there's these other nations of indigenous people that we can connect with. Um, and the pandemic has done a wonderful thing for us. It's made us comfortable in a Zoom environment, right? So how do we get the, our, our kids to create like little ambassador programs where we can um, interact with each other and, and let the kids do the talking? You know, they, when the teens come together, it doesn't matter where you are, they talk and they, they have fun and they, they, they know what they need to say and, and how to represent themselves. And that's part of who we are as, as indigenous educators as helping giving them that, that confidence in who they are so that we can, we can bring that out and share with each other. And just like we're doing today, um, right now in the Zoom. Thank you, Watnaway. And I really loved the connection to like, how can students do that? How can young people be those ambassadors for their community? Because there are different ways that we all um, engage with community, depending on the generation that we come from and our personal experiences, maybe where we've um, grown up and uh, how we've grown up, if, if your family was displaced through uh, re relocation, then your experience is going to be different than that of someone whose family has lived on their traditional homelands for many, many generations and or people who come from multiple tribal experiences. So all of that influences how we as native people interact with the world. And I think that that's such an important piece of it too, is to, to engage young people in doing some of that work. Um, so we have a question in the chat or in the Q and A um, section from um, one of our participants about saying um, and how that is being shared internationally with communities um, and wondering if it's appropriate to utilize native languages. Um, so this is specifically Lakota um, or Dakota. I think we, we both say it in our languages um, to use that in prayer or as something that the world should, can we want the world to recognize and, and understand. Um, Leona, I want to see if you have an answer for this question. Sure, thank you. Um, I think um, when you are working with a larger group of people, it's really important to encourage that they bring in their own languages um, when it comes to prayer, you know, and things like that, and and really look at the concept and the meaning of what that means. So, what does Midake Oyase mean? And when you uh, translate that into English, approaching it from Lakota thought and philosophy, what does that mean? And in your own tribal languages, what do you have that equates to that? What do you have? What concepts do you have? And really, um, you know, like we've all been saying is really promoting that idea of learning about one another's indigenous backgrounds, indigenous languages, because if we don't, we, we start to foster that pan-Indianism and those stereotypes, you know, that come along with everybody saying how, you know, and things like that. Um, and so it's, it's cool to have like, you know, if you do have that one concept, but really look at what it means. Why are you using it? And within your own tribe, what, what do you have? What can you learn from this? What can you share about this? Thank you, Leona. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add on that question? Okay. Um, I often encourage people to look at the nations whose land that they live on and see if they're engaged, if there's a way to engage in the community there. Not necessarily take on that responsibility yourself if that's not um, a nation that claims you, but to engage with the, in that conversation with that community so that you are being respectful and responsive to their needs and including them in that conversation instead of just saying 
well, this is something that I'm doing. And so I'm just going to use your knowledge. So what are the right ways to go about that process? And how do we as adults continue to engage in those Mm -hmm. educational conversations and learning so that we can pass on the correct ways to engage with Native communities um, moving into the future. So I think that that's important. Um, I think that there are Lakota people who do similar work, um, who do utilize that language, but then it's important to connect and understand how that's used within our community um, or Lakota communities. and so just to think about that in, in how you are approaching things. Um, and then there was another question about um, resources of wisdom keepers in different communities. I had recommended to reach out to local tribal communities and um, local uh, like Native American centers if you're in an urban area. And so I don't know if any of you all have any resources that you'd like to share of Wisdom Keepers on various topics. Um, I know for with First Peoples Fund, you can visit our website and there's a list of artists and the, the different practitioners um, that we have worked with in the past and people who have received fellowships um, and awards for their work in their communities. Um, but that doesn't mean they were necessarily connecting people to directly directly to those artists and community members um, because we want to respect the autonomy and needs of them as tradition keepers in their own communities. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. I can add something quick that uh, when I looked at that question, um, tribal colleges and universities usually um, are are created to um, to help um, reconnect, you know, uh, that the tribal culture and language and knowledge with the um, people. And so, you'll usually find um, a lot of the um, culture bearers work with tribal colleges and universities. Um, that connection there, or that relationship there, is stronger than it is with um, like state schools and things like that. So that's usually one place that I always direct people to is. Um, to a tribal college and university first, and then kind of branch out from there. Thank you, Leona. Um, with, um, we are out of time, so I can't um, answer any more of the questions, uh, but I do wanna share how you can continue to be involved in our work. Um, Okay, so we want to thank you. Um, thank you the fe- to the fellows for sharing your expertise with the audience today. We also want to thank the audience for spending your Saturday here with us. We know your time is precious. Uh, please join us for our next conversation in April. Um, dispossession, adaptation, reclamation, and resilience. A conversation about the We the Peoples Before pedagogical framework. Um, On the screen, you can see our upcoming virtual events. Uh, The dates and times are going to be announced and I will be sharing that information with you via email um, through the email that you uh, signed up for this webinar with. If you would like to learn more about We the Peoples Before Educational Initiative or any future events, please contact me, Emmy Hermeni Horses at lorna at firstpeoplesfund.org. You can also support this initiative by clicking on the link that we are providing in the chat. Um, and to learn more about First Peoples Fund and the We the People Before um, initiative, please visit our websites. I'm putting all of those here in the chat for you. Um, and with that, um have a wonderful saturday and i'm so glad we got to have this conversation here today
Thank you, Emmy. We'll see you all tomorrow. I was just going to ask the same thing. <laughs> well, yeah, I was, yep. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. So, oh, Emmy, would you remind me about tomorrow? I don't know if I have that on my calendar. Yeah, tomorrow is optional. Um, I'm going to stop recording. I know how to do that. It's daylight savings, too. So it's a little different. But it's.